Well, welcome to the 11th Annual Youth Safety Conference of the Long Island Youth Safety Coalition. I'm Renee Fischer, Director of Community Affairs for the District Attorney, Madeline Singus. And uh, we are thrilled that you are here. Some of you have been to these events before, and you may realize that we're not in the same place. We used to do it at a university, and we used to do it for 300 people. We've had to squeeze this down to half the size, which is why you're so uh, crammed, but we're glad you're here. But for those of uh, your friends who couldn't come, don't despair. We intend to do a sequel event for those who couldn't come. So uh, we should be okay. A little bit of housekeeping. There's a, an evaluation form that we want you to fill out because the quality of these events depends on your feedback. We want to know what you thought of the event. We want to know what you'd like to see in the future and what we could do better. And we really take that very seriously, so do that. Also, there's a lot of credits being given, you know, for case acts, for education, for psychologists, for social workers, for lawyers. That all works if you filled out your forms. So definitely do that. Also, you've got to be here for the whole thing to get all six hours. Uh, one other thing. Okay. We have done the topics of youth safety on so many different things. We've done them on bullying, internet safety, dangerous driving, sex, drugs, rock and roll. We've done it all. And today we're looking at the topic that we think is one of the most serious. And of course it's one that's been with us forever, which is the world of mental health and substance abuse. I don't know if you saw the Times this weekend, but there was an article about the class of 2000 talked about how the class of 2000 was destroyed by the opioid crisis. And I thought about it, because here we are on the eve of 2020, and we're not all that much better, but we've been doing a lot. So it made me wonder, what about the class of 2020, which you are all working with? And that's why we're here today, to talk about prevention, what we can do. Now you might ask, what in the world is the district attorney's office involved with this. Well, the DA's office under Madeline Singus has made a very strong commitment to prevention. We don't want to see the crimes happen at all. And so we work really hard. And she's invested so much effort, money, staff on prevention programs. But we also believe strongly in protection. So we believe in prevention and protection. And you may have noticed that only uh, a month or so ago, the largest bust of fentanyl in the history of Nassau County was done in partnership with other law enforcement and our office of the district attorneys. And also a huge trove of guns came in. So drugs and guns is still a very, very big problem. So I am very, very proud to be part of the DA's office and very proud to be here with an exceptional district attorney who, by the way, just got reelected, Madeline Sayers. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Renee uh, and the Long Island uh, Youth Safety Coalition. Renee is just such a force. I know so many of you in this room know him, but uh, we couldn't get any of this done without uh, him and the ADAs and support staff uh, from my office who worked to put something like this together, which really, I'm so excited because there's so many of you here, uh, and it's so important. You know, I read the article that Renee mentioned in the Times <clears throat> this weekend and it was so depressing because so many people have gotten caught up in addiction and you know it's not just the person that's impacted it's their family it's their community it's their church it's their house of worship uh, it's their employment every the ripple effects uh, uh, of what goes on are incredible and so many people and generations become impacted. Uh, so, you know, in the DA's office, we talk a lot about what we can do to help people in our community. Uh, and one thing we do, and we do it well, is enforcement. Uh, and, you know, we will not, you know, we don't abide by drug dealers in our neighborhoods bringing in tons of fentanyl, heroin. Enforcement is strong. We take down drug operations and drug trafficking organizations top to bottom, and we've been doing that very effectively. But we realized that we couldn't arrest our way out of this situation, and without getting people the treatment that they need to overcome their addictions, we weren't going to really turn a corner. So we were committed to giving funding uh, and making sure that we divert people who we think need help as opposed to prison. So we invest a lot in alternatives to incarceration. We invest a lot in treatment. 
And things like this for us is equally important because we realize we can't do it alone in our office. So without reaching out to educators and other law enforcement agencies and our social workers and guidance counselors and the medical community, uh, that if we don't do it holistically, we're not really going to make an impact. So that's what this is all about. And in addition to being the DA, I'm also a mom. And I have twins graduating. They're class of 2020, seniors in high school. So you know, I live it every day. You know, what I talk about in my professional life, I talk about in my private life as well with my kids. And we talk a lot uh, about things that you talk to your children about and in your professional capacities. How to withstand that party culture when you're a senior in high school. Uh, how to say no. How to make the right choices so that your life isn't affected um, in, a, in, a, in a dramatic way. So I live it every day. I'm committed to it. My office is committed to making sure uh, that we're doing all we can to keep our kids safe. Uh, and if that's talking to them in schools, we're there. There are prosecutors in my office who are in schools several times a month talking about things like dating violence and heroin addiction and internet safety. Uh, and we are that drum that's going to be constantly beating because it's that important to get to our kids and get to them younger and younger. So I thank you all for the work that you do because uh, it is incredible, it is important, uh, and again, we can't do it without you. So I, I, I'm excited for today. I think there are so many great uh, speakers that you'll be hearing from, so many incredibly important topics that we have to tackle. And these are important conversations to have. They're not easy, but the fact that you're here and willing to do the work and roll up your sleeves uh, is really so significant. So thank you all and have a great conference. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon. Okay, uh, I know that we're tight with chairs. We're trying to get some more. Uh, I know some people are not going to be here all day and will be leaving. And so the, for those of you bravely standing in the back, I think it's my friends from Northport. You will get seated eventually, I, I hope, so bear with us. All right, as I said, this is the first time we do things here. So uh, if ever you've done dinners or shows or te taught classes, you know that what can go wrong will go wrong. And there's another corollary. If you think everything is going well, you are not looking hard enough. So we're going to have some screw-ups around here, but so far we're okay. Um, so bear with us. It's, it's, it's a partnership. Okay, we have a full boat. One of the things that we wanted to do was you definitely wanted to get youth participation in the presentations. I mean, the audience is really teachers and law enforcement and youth workers, but we wanted the voice of the young people. So our very first presentation is we reached out to both Nassau and to Suffolk, uh, some amazing teachers and kids who worked on a number of projects. We're there, to, we're about to come up and tell us all about it. We also ran a video PSA competition this year. We had about 17 schools that won prizes. It was here, and we're going to show you a couple of the uh, winning PSAs that the kids have put together for us. Hopefully, we'll do another competition. So at this point, I'd like to call up. I think we're going to, I think it's, uh, Leviton Antunes goes first. Is that how you've worked it out? Good, come on up. All right. And you can all come up. The Northport, come on. I happen to be from Northport, so very prejudiced. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Bonsignore. I'm a teacher, phys ed teacher, and health teacher in Island Trees High School. I've been in the community uh, my entire life as a former alum, uh, now a teacher for, for 20 years, and a coach as well. Um, I just want to first thank Michelle Williams, who's to my left. Uh, she recommended me to Mrs. Romer was our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction last year to get involved with the Levittown Community Action Coalition. Um, and it really hits home, obviously, as a teacher in the community, as an alum, and also having kids in the, in the Salt Middle School. So it definitely hits home with, with this coalition. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be involved and be able to uh, work with such amazing people in the community, teachers, administrators. Um, but the most important people are to my right and to my left are the students, which you're going to hear about in a few minutes, or from in a few minutes. Uh, first, I'd just like to talk about the coalition. Um, our mission statement and our vision is up on the board, but I'm just going to read it just so you understand where we're coming from. The mission is to create a safe, healthy, and secure community for children and adults where untimely deaths and lives affected by addiction are reduced through
through prevention, education, and engagement. Our vision is for residents of the Levittown and surrounding communities to respond to life's challenges without resorting to the use and abuse of alcohol, opiates, or other drugs, and to continue to support a community where people feel safe, valued, connected, and empowered. That connectedness part is the biggest part we feel. When students are connected, they are, they, they are connected to their peers, they're connected to their teachers, and they're connected to their community, which increases, it's been shown to increase positive decision making. So you could talk about drugs, you could talk about alcohol, we could talk about different destructive decision making, e-cigarettes and vaping, but it comes down to why are they making these decisions. And that's what you're really going to hear from the students of, of why the youth subcommittee was created. I'd like to introduce from Division Avenue High School, Natalie and Sophia, who will talk about the, how we began. I'm Natalie Rodriguez. I'm a senior and I've been involved with the coalition since freshman year. Hi, my name is Sofia Ferrero. I'm a freshman at Division Avenue High School and I've been involved with the coalition since I was in middle school. First, we began by first us students talking about our concerns and the issues to the Levittown Committee, Community Action Coalition Steering Committee. We discussed what we saw in our communities and in our schools regarding vaping, drinking, and smoking. We feel that our peers use these substances because they think that it's, that everyone's doing it and that it's fun and that it relieves stress. Um, our parents and our friends are the people that influence us most. However, we feel the coalition could help. We've already started educating younger schools, like elementary schools, about these issues and coping mechanisms, and we are discussing the con consequences of these actions. Thank you, girls. So, hence the youth subcommittee was created. It was formed in January of 2018, and members of the Levittown and Island Tree School Districts, staff members, administration, guidance counselors, and obviously the students was a big, big important piece to have their voice heard. Too many times as adults, they constantly hear, don't do this, don't do that. It's just like the little kid who's one or two years old, you tell them the stove is hot, they don't believe you, they touch the stove, pull their hand away, yeah, that was hot. More likely they're gonna tell their older brother, older sister, or younger brother, younger sister that, don't do that. It comes better from, a, from the students than the adults saying don't, 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 don't. It sends a better message. And it's not just don't use drugs. Don't, <coughs> don't, don't eat, use e-cigarettes or vapes. It's more about making positive decisions. What, are, what is there to do in Levittown? You hear in any community across the United States, in, in any country, this place is so boring. Well, why is it boring? And we talk, we talk to them about it's boring in their brain, there are other things to do, they just don't know about it. So it's easier to go to something destructive, it's easier to go to something that's negative, but it's more about being a leader in the community, and that's what these students are to my right and to my left. So the importance of youth empowerment and peer-to-peer -peer education. Just have a quote. Uh, youth involvement can benefit schools, organizations, and their efforts in prevention, as well as the youth themselves. As I said before, being connected versus being disconnected is a huge piece to all of this. And then you can see from the next slide here how we are all connected. The three high schools in the Levittown community, as well as the three middle schools, that are all part of this process. It's not we might be rivals in sports and different activities, but at the end of the day, we are one community. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to now introduce Jamie Roach. Good morning, my name is Jamie Roach and I teach health and phys ed, uh, seventh grade level and eighth grade level at Island Trees Middle School and also social emotional learning for the sixth graders. I just want to say how amazing it has been and rewarding to work with these students who are just as concerned as we all are in minimizing the e-cigarette <coughs> epidemic. Our students are involved in numerous extracurricular activities, but they prioritize their time working collaboratively to promote uh, physical and mental health amongst our community members. 
I'm going to have the students come up and talk about different pieces of what we accomplished throughout the year. So first up, I have Gabby, who's going to be talking about the Did You Know Facts. Every Friday, there were Did You Know Facts over the morning announcements that were mostly about statistics of vaping, how vaping is bad for you, and what's in them, and more. These, fr these facts were every Friday, so they were persistent and got the message out. They were interesting and got kids thinking and discussing about vaping and how it's bad for them. All the students were also able to hear the facts because it was during morning announcements and they were listening over the, for the club announcements and everything else so they could hear it well. They were also a good addition to the posters that we hung up about anti-vaping because it provided students with an auditory and a visual perspective on the negative impact of vaping. Next up, we have Kaylee, who's going to be talking about the posters that we put up throughout the middle school. We placed anti-vaping posters around our school. These pictures included images of a brain bending machine, popcorn lung, and other anti-vaping images. We placed these photos in locations that everyone will see throughout the school day. Posters are found in the main lobby, locker rooms, and throughout each grade's hallway. We purposely put posters in places that created multiple opportunities for stu students to notice and examine them throughout the day. By doing this, we received positive feedback and had multiple people say what they thought of the posters. Students also shared how it affected their thoughts on vaping. Michelle Williams, a junior, will be talking about the um, anti-vaping PSAs. A choose to refuse, I apologize. Choose to refuse. <laughs> At the high school, we began our Choose to Refuse campaign with the teachers. We had each teacher fill out a simple poster which said the things <clears throat> they did that kept them from doing drugs. These posters were hung outside of each teacher's classroom for everyone to see. Then, we turned our campaign to the students. During our Battle of the Classes week, students filled out the same poster as teachers, except they were organized by class color. The posters were hung with each grade's bleachers. This campaign was very successful and received positive feedback from both students and teachers. And now we have Rebecca and Amelia talking about the anti-vaping PSAs. <coughs> so, these first, so over here we see how uh, the different schools were working together to make different anti-vaping PSAs, which were later shown along with videos in our gym classes, which are shown here where students were able to see throughout the middle and high school, where the video was able to teach the majority of students in our middle and high schools on the dangers of vaping. In addition to the vaping video we saw in gym, we were also able to create PSAs in our Levittown coalition, which were shown in our students' homerooms. We conducted multiple surveys in our middle school. Initially, we had students fill out a survey on their general opinions on vaping. After they watched a video and the uh, affirmated PSA, they filled out the same Google form again, but, n but using the new knowledge they obtained from the video. These are the results of the post survey. These first results are showing the students' perception on vaping after being shown the footage, with 94% of students taking the survey saying they either felt that vaping was harmful or extremely harmful. The impact of the PSAs were very visibly shown. These are the survey results that demonstrate how big of an issue students believe vaping is in our own school district. 468 students chose either three or four to show that vaping is a huge problem and very prominent in our school. With these facts, students can be on the lookout and report to an adult if they see someone vaping. They will be reassured that they are helping the student and try to help them understand the harms and the real consequences of vaping. So this was one of the, the PSAs that the students created. And it was called The Real Cost of Vaping. So obviously the e-cigarettes and the vaping issue has been a major, major concern. Um, as we talked about the destructive decision making, um, we have tons of friends that are, that are nurses, um, and the emergency room visits that are happening because of the different types of things that are going on with their, with inside their lungs without them realizing. They think it's just cotton candy, it's just a, you know, tropical fruit, whatever the fruits might be, but not realizing the chemicals, as well as um, the, the liquid THC that is part of it too, that, that's getting kids not only addicted, but sick as well.
So what was great about this, it showed students, a lot of students, you know, especially when they start to get into junior and senior year, how much money is being spent without them realizing it. They all want to have jobs, but they don't realize that the money that they're making is going towards all these things that, that are destructive. So it's, you know, part of their, their, their PSA was, what 11th grader or 12th grader wouldn't want $1,000 in their pocket at the end of the year? So it's, a, it's an important message that, that they brought about. And we, they're the ones that created this. We did not create it, we're just showing it. And it's, would you rather have that money in your pocket or in your lungs? It was one of the pictures of a student that, besides what's happening inside internally, these things are exploding in people's po in, in pockets, they're exploding in their faces, because anything that you heat up and charge is going to have some sort of an effect. Um, all these things that look like the flash drive that we have now, th those, those pods, those jewels, you, you can easily kind of hide it. There was a, a video that, that um, I've seen as a health teacher where teachers, administrators, were walking through a classroom that they put different things in. They set it up where they were hidden in sweatshirts. They were hidden in, in pens. Their pen would actually write, and on the back side of the pen would be the jewel charge. So it is pretty scary. So you have to be more aware as an adult, as a parent, a teacher, um, but it's really the, the, the students that have to understand the damaging effects that these things could happen. Okay, Jamie. Okay. Sorry, Vicki Fernback. Good morning. My name is Vicki Fernback. I've been in the Island Tree School District for 14 years. I teach health and physical education at the high school. I'm going to talk to you about the two good for um, drugs after school program. Um, it's a pilot program led by Jamie and myself with the assistance of the LCAC members. It was a four-week after-school program for our fourth graders. The lessons focused on social-emotional learning skills such as goal-setting, problem-solving, effective communication, healthy decision-making, and coping skills. This year's program will run from four sessions to 12 sessions. Just want to say also with the assistance of the coalition group, the girls have come over and other members have come over to help with the fourth grade program. And it's nice to see because our students, fourth graders, look up to our older students and um, actually had good interactions with them. The next is the um, community presentations. It's also an after school presentation and it's open up to all community members where LCAC, where LCAC students have presented. The goal of the presentations is to reduce the um, prevalence of substance abuse amongst youth, vaping and underage drinking. I'd like to introduce to you Emily. She's from Division High School. She's going to talk about the PACS program. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Light. I'm a sophomore at Division Avenue High School, and I've been a part of the coalition since middle school. After speaking with the Levittown Community Action Coalition adults about why students begin to use substances and how we felt it was important to talk to students at a young age, Levittown School District began a program called PACS. PACS means school productivity, peace, happiness, health, and harmonious social interactions. PACS is a universal preventative program that helps students feel good about themselves, learn self-control, and to be kind to each other. It teaches the children to regulate their emotions and are rewarded for doing well with granny prizes, which are 30-second rewards that reinforce good behavior. All second grade classrooms at Levittown School District currently participate in PACS. Second graders are already reporting that they're learning coping skills, feeling connected to others and their classmates, and are excited about PACS. Thank you. So in closing, you can see the amazing job that the students did from, from both the Levittown School District, MacArthur, Division Avenue, Wisdom Lane, Salk, Island Trees High School, and Island Trees Middle School. So with the help of, of them, they are really building this coalition. As well as the Yes Community Council, uh, Community Center, excuse me, Larissa and Corinne, amazing job that they do. The meetings that happen between the, the different districts at the Yes Community Center, um, as well as the, the VFW halls, everybody is involved. Everybody has that Again, I'm going to say it again, that connectiveness. Everybody has a piece that's an important piece that is going to make the difference with our future. Too many students are dying. Too many students are coming down with, with diseases that need to stop. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Beth Romer, our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum, for, for allowing us to do this. Thank you, guys.
Thank you, Michael, and the whole team. Uh, you didn't let us down. We're so proud of you. So this is all about coalition building. This is a coalition. And by the way, on the evaluation, you'll see three questions of uh, asking if there's anything you want, such as some of you are involved with Narcan. You may need more. Take a look at that. We'll help to supply you if that's what you need. Another one is, would you like to belong to this coalition? We love you. There's no charge. We have 400 members so far. We'd love to have you. And uh, the third one is mental health training, which is very big right now. And if you needed mental health training for your programs, uh, let us know about it. So I am absolutely thrilled and uh, just to have seen the, uh, the coalition. I'm so glad to see grassroots coalition organizing and kids. Now, I mentioned that I am from Northport, so uh, unabashedly prejudiced, but I'd like to call up my good buddy, Anthony Ferrandino, from Northport East Northport, Joey Knuckle Task Force, to introduce your team. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna talk for about a minute because I really think this is about these guys and I'm gonna let these guys have as much time as they can. That's Kat Giuliano, my youth coordinator for the Drug and Alcohol Task Force. I am also the Drug and Alcohol Counselor for the Northport East Northport School District. So today we're gonna to have two groups speaking about different projects that they're doing within and outside the school. We're gonna have our youth coalition from One Life, Maya, will be talking about what our youth coalition has been up to. And then within the school, we also have another program called Students for 60,000. It's a club in the school. I'm not gonna, I'll let them talk about what they do. But Mr. Darrell St. George, who's our advisor for that club, they're also doing stuff on the front with drug and alcohol and as it impacts. And I think the important thing to realize is that these clubs and these activities are completely student-led, adult-guided. Which that means that I just step out of the way and I say, what do you need me to do? And they take care of it. So all the projects that they're going to present are, are committees they came up with, they're brainstorming, their ideas, their brainchilds, and we just provide them whatever resources they need to make sure they can get it done. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Maya, who's going to kick us off. All right. Okay, um, my name is Maya Jordan. I'm a senior at Northport High School, and I've been a member of One Life since it like began in 2017. Um, one Life stands for Learn, Inspire, Fulfill, and Empower, and it's the Northport East Northport Drug and Alcohol Task Force Youth Coalition. So obviously as part of the Drug and Alcohol Task Force, a big part of what we do is talking about substance abuse in our community. But it's hard to talk about substance abuse without realizing what else is connected to it. So um, a big part of our mission is talking about mental health and bringing um, coping mechanisms and mental health resources to students at Northport High School and throughout the town. Um, so these are some pictures, and there's more, but um, these are from Wellness Week. So Wellness Week started as one day in 2018, where we had speakers come in and talk to the kids about mental health, and we have an area in the high school called the Commons, where we had um, resource tables so kids could get like counseling numbers and just have different activities. Last year we expanded it to a full week, so we had one day focused on mental health, one day on emotional wellness, one day on social wellness, and one day on physical health. So some of the things we do is we try to break up the day to really engage the students. So we have um, a combination of speakers. Last year we had people talking about healthy relationships, um, mental illnesses like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and talking about how that can specifically relate to students and their families. And we also, um, on Emotional Wellness Day, we also called it Coping Skills Day, um, we had people come in and do yoga. We made aromatherapy bracelets. Um, just different things kids could take home and hopefully they could learn some of these practices and work on handling their issues in a healthy way without having to turn to drug and alcohol use. Um, with the task force, uh, one of the main events we do each October is the color run. So we have hundreds of people from the community come together. Um, we do like a fun run type activity with a lot of color. Um, this is a joint effort between the task force and us students. So, you know, it's just, a great way to see people like most of us are seniors and juniors but to see these kids like come out on Saturday mornings and, like work with people in the town to just like provide this for a lot of the younger kids it's really cool to see the whole community come together for events like this so it just shows people that there's a lot of resources and like um, Levittown was saying there's things to do in your community that you might not have ever realized 
Um, a big part of what we do is getting engaged in the community. So some of the things we're part of is um, our town does medication take backs and collections. So each time we go and advertise and we have a table at the libraries where we can share our resources and other things. So that's a great way to engage um, some of the older community members and we just get a lot of people at the library, people who are interested in what we're doing and come up to our tables. Um, so we're definitely always advertising for the color run and I think a big part of it is getting out into your community and interacting with all different types of people. We focus on students but we want to make sure that you know, everything is so interconnected. You can't target students without also addressing their families and their families' needs. Um, another event we do each summer is this environmental scan at a beach that's local to us, Crab Meadow. So there's an area that's known for, you know, like some drug use or partying, and um, each year we go. And we just kind of pick up what we can find and we share it with the task force and the police department. So we find, you know, jewel pods, um, uh, cans of alcohol and things like that, cigarettes. Um, so it's a good way. Um, one thing we're trying to do is realizing what else could we use this space for. I mean, it's part of like a nature preserve. So either expanding that, making it something that's more obvious for the police department to see. It's really just trying to get into each area of the community where we think things could be happening and having students um, engage with it and try to work on that. So this is a picture of us at this event we have each July. So it's a barbecue. Again, we can bring kids and their families and they can all spend time together. And um, it's just a good way to keep like a dialogue about drug use, but also incorporate fun activities that like bring people together. Because in our experience, it's easier to connect with people without the use of like scare tactics sometimes. When you can have an honest and open conversation with people, they're much more receptive. You know, people get less defensive when we have conversations like that. So, yeah. And because One Life stands for Learn, Inspire, Fulfill, Empower, it's really interesting to see how all of us have been educated and we know so much not only about community organizing, but also about substance abuse and its impacts on, you know, physical health, social wellness, um, you know, your relationships. And we've helped to inspire other people in our school and our community. Um, we definitely, it's a fulfilling thing for students to um, have, <laughs> yeah, I know, um, to, you know, just to know that you're making a difference in your community and having kids interested in what we're doing each year when we have these events, people are coming up to us asking how they can be involved. I mean, that's a really cool way to see people who, you know, you don't know what other activities we could turn to and we're all very close now because of this club or coalition. And um, it's also just super empowering to know that each individual, I mean, and we're young, I started this, I was a part of this club when I was 15, to know that you can make a difference in your community it just encourages you to do more and more. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, we have a couple things coming up that I just wanted to mention quickly. Uh, we have a medication take back, which I mentioned before. We do those at the libraries, and we also let people know that uh, you can drop off your medication at the police department uh, pretty much around the clock. Um, we're doing a digital citizenship program for the fifth graders, so we're trying to expand into the elementary and middle schools, talking to younger kids about, you know, wellness, like on the internet and healthy relationships. We're doing a workshop with Huntington Sanctuary to expand some of our work with like coping skills and coping mechanisms. And we're very excited for Wellness Week 2020. I mean, it's expanded exponentially since we started in 2018 with one day. We brought it to four last year, and we're super excited to see what we could bring this year and make it bigger and better than ever. So, thank you. You can follow us on Instagram at One Life uh, NPT. We keep pretty much, we're constantly updating it with all of our information. That's another great way to connect with teenagers um, in our community. And, you know, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook as well, and our website, which is www.ndatf.org. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Lucas Zimas. I am a senior at Northport High School, and I think, I believe this is probably one of the largest groups I've spoken to before, so <laughs> forgive me if my nerves are prevalent during the speech. So one of the groups that, uh, along with Long One Life at Northboro High School, is Students for 60,000. Students for 60,000 is basically a humanitarian group at the school, and for the past two years, we've the, our main projects have been going to Nicaragua uh, for a service trip that you can be a part of through active participation in the, in the club. And basically when we would go down there is we would build homes and, and just provide needs for the people there in any way, shape, or form that we could through the funds that we had raised. Although f since last year, we, we kind of worked to focus a little bit more on specifically opioid and drug awareness and prevention. And that was due to a new advisor coming in named Daryl St. George, who couldn't make it today, but um, he has been very involved through every step of the way. And when he first came in as the new advisor, this was something that he was very passionate about from the start. And he gathered five or six of us, five or six of the students, a part of the club, and we started like an opioid task force in the club, respectively. And we would just have meetings when, every week, whenever we needed. And we just thought of ways to talk about what we could do to help raise awareness to the opioid epidemic. And from the start, one of the things that was very popular in topic was a service trip to West Virginia, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later on. But um, we talked about West Virginia going there and talking to students there and seeing how it affected them because I'm not sure if everyone here knows, West Virginia is the ground zero for the opioid epidemic. It is very prevalent there and it's something that we noticed and something that we wanted to be involved in. More locally, some things that we did was we focused on um, having committee meetings and going to meetings similar to this where where either we would speak or we would listen to people speaking and we would have communication and networking, which is um, kind of like the theme of what we were focusing on with this particular project. And then another thing that we tried to do was Purdue Pharma has a like almost headquarters in Connecticut, I believe is the area, something like that. And we were discussing how we would write a letter through our club and present it to them, basically talking about the opioid epidemic and maybe we could have a sit down conversation with someone from Purdue Pharma as they are distributing a lot of the opioids that people are getting addicted on. Obviously this did not work out the way we exactly expected because we made this letter and we almost got no reply. But with the letter, that was kind of the starting ground for what we were doing with our communications and networking. Because since then, all the people that we have met through this project, we have asked them to sign this and asked them to be a part of this. And one day we hope to have this letter have a lot of signatures so we can go back and maybe have more of a message. And um, as I said, communication and networking is a very big part of what we've done. When we went to West Virginia, that was, a lot of people asked us what we were planning on doing there since it, a lot of it wasn't hands-on. And most of it was networking and communicating and meeting new people that also wanted to be a part of this. And to this day, that's something that's very important to us as, as the club. We are always looking for new partners and looking for ways to build on what we're already doing. And I see a lot of people in here that are also interested in this. And I just think it's great to come to these things and to talk to people that are also interested in this. So now um, Chelsea's gonna talk a little bit more about the specific service trip to West Virginia. And additionally, how the people from West Virginia actually came here over the summer and met with us and we did projects together. Thank you. Hello, okay. I'm like Luca, this may go awful, but okay. Um, so last February, we went to West Virginia. 
So pretty much what happens in West Virginia or anywhere is that a lot of the parents of the children are drug addicts and so what happens is they become drug addicts. They either die or they go, sorry, they die or they go to um, facilities and so the children are left a lot of times alone or with their grandparents or whoever. And this is a, um, like a place where a lot of the kids come after school or like round clock and they like nurture them and then they almost make them like as normal of the life they can. Um, like there was this boy who, his like father just passed away literally when we came. He like got the notice that his dad's dead and but he was still there because it's a safe space for those kids and they try to direct them towards a different path than their than their parents. So yeah, okay. So grand families, so what happens is, oh, it's up here, okay, cool. Um, so these kids are left alone and then because, I'll give you an example, a grandmother came to speak to us and um, her daughter was just murdered by her boyfriend, the father was, you know, either dead or somewhere else with drugs, and they're left to take care of the um, their children. Um, sorry. <laughs> but what happens is that because a lot of them are older and not equipped to care for another child, they don't have the means or they don't have a job or they don't have the money to properly fund, you know, taking care of another kid. So this organization helps them out a lot and gives them advice and um, funds and whatever they can to ensure a better, a better life for those kids because they don't have their, oh, sorry. I told you I could go bad. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Tug Valley High School. So during the service trip, we went to this high school just to like meet the kids. But then we uh, went to a basketball game and we really got to, can everyone hear me? Is this going good? Okay. <laughs> um, we really got to get to know them. And we, what was that place called? Like that? that we went to? The, like the pizza, oh, it's up there. Huh? this local pizzeria with everyone and we really realized that even though it was the community kermit had so many hardships and so much death and drugs they still are so connected with each other because they they drive off of that and everyone there is so lovely and they they just welcomed anyone to help them so yeah, that's Tug Valley. They also came down a couple students, like Luca was saying, and we had a, like an exchange thing. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay, so we're going back to West Virginia in April, and we're going to continue projects that we have down there, and we're going to um, just jump off where we ended last February and continue, yeah, continue the stuff, and hopefully, the students from Tug Valley will come down again and yeah, anything else? Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>